Hey, Newscast listeners, just want to give you a little information about the mission of the Newscast. Our mission stems from the mission of the Red Smith Banquet, and that mission was to support youth sports in the Fox Valley. Over the 57 years of its existence, we've been honored to give out over a million dollars to various youth sports organizations throughout the Fox Valley. The NoosaCast is looking to continue that mission and support youth sports as well. You can help us do that by donating to the NoosaCast and the Red Smith Sports Banquet. On today's 4th of July NoosaCast, we are talking water skiing, because why wouldn't you talk water skiing on the 4th of July? The Web Footers out of Fremont. Our old look at new brought to you by Raleigh Winter and Associates. Well, Tash and I dig pretty deep into some 4th of July history here in the state. Not going to want to miss that. Our Red Smith Banquet Throwback brings us to 2014 when the University of Wisconsin legendary track coach Ed Nettycomb joined us. And we finish the show like we always do with a little It's Forgotten and I'll Never Forget. So what do you say, folks? Let's light a sparkler and get this show on the road. The people who have really, really dedicated themselves to this sport, they have got so much of this into literally science in terms of the technique of the climbing technique and the, the methodologies to the pyramids. There's a lot of science to it, although... Sometimes there's a lot of chaos that ends up happening in the water as well. Welcome to the NoosaCast. What is a NoosaCast? It's where we bring local folk stories to life through conversation. Newscast listeners, welcome to July 4th. This is our 4th of July episode. It comes out on July 4th. It's fantastic. Uh, Celebrate, obviously, our nation and uh, everything that we have to do about that. Although we won't be able to watch uh, Nathan's hot dog eating contest with Joey Chestnut, unfortunately, because he's banned because he endorsed another brand. But, um, hey, it's always a, yeah, you know what? It's always fun. Uh, you got to love July 4th, Joe. I, you got any big plans for July 4th? Yeah, happy 4th of July, everybody. We're not talking yeah. politics, I can tell you that, Tash, but we will nope. celebrate the 4th of July, definitely. Yeah, yeah. there's a lot, always good stuff going on. I know it's not quite the same in Appleton. Uh, the 4th uh, Festival is kind of down, but there's still fireworks. And you know what? There's all kinds of places you can go to check out amazing fireworks in this area with nina and menasha and kimberly and appleton up in green bay uh it's there's plenty of places to go check stuff out and um, i'm sure that if your neighborhood is anything like mine it is pretty much an artillery range for the next week so (laughs) absolutely yeah no doubt uh no i've certainly i mean i've seen my fair share of fireworks through the years with the kids and always enjoyed it but uh they're a little too old for that and I don't know what I'm doing the fourth Tash. It's nice not to work that day. I can tell you that. So I think I'm just gonna gonna chill out, maybe on my back porch and listen to the fireworks. Like you said, the the artillery range. It's it's the same in my neighborhood I, as well. I know you have a dog. Does your dog uh, tolerate the fireworks? I, my old dog Willow, the Golden Doodle, absolutely hated. I'm scared to death. My Basset Hound doesn't give a crap about anything, Tash. So no, yeah. it doesn't doesn't bother her in the in the least. Yeah, my dogs are the same way. They don't care. Yeah. So it's kind of, it's very nice. I know there's lots of people who hate this time of year because of their, their animals and their pets. Um, right. Yeah. Mine could care less. So that's yeah. a good thing. Yeah. I know that's a real deal. You know what we could hope for it, Tash, at least for the scared animals is maybe some more rain because we haven't had enough of that. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I'm not even going to go there with being, <laughs> being a, in a family of farmers on my wife's side. I oh. have not talked to them. Uh, it, it has been a lot of rain for sure. Yeah, it's been nuts. And I mean, nobody wants to hear talk about the weather other than that. It, uh, it kind of sucked, Tash. At this, you know, we were excited. We, we mentioned it in the last show that Digstown was going to play at Riverside on, on Friday night. And we were all fired up. We were going to be there. The NoosaCast team was going to be there. We were ready to get down. And yeah, they had to cancel the show. All, all, all the outdoor venues that night, there was, there was a few good shows around town that night. And they all, they all got canceled, unfortunately. 
Yeah, it happens. And unfortunately, we're in a little wet streak here for the month of June. But hopefully July becomes a little bit drier for everybody. Uh, looks like the 4th is going to be nice. So nice. if you are getting out to check out any fireworks, you should be clear on that. And, uh, you know, hopefully if you have some family time and things like that, you'll uh, have a nice 4th of July for that. Oh, absolutely. I just before we recorded, I was at the grocery store and I made sure to pick up some brats, some cheddy worse and some other goodies, some meat, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm going to get break out the grill, and you got to eat on the fourth, right? I mean, that's that's how you celebrate. Absolutely, absolutely. I just saw a little episode on, uh, I think, the Food Network, and they did some hot dogs in some different ways, and they actually kind of sliced the hot dogs and put like little slices in, and then marinated them in red wine vinegar, ketchup, and mustard, and just let the hot dogs sit in that. For like a day and then put them on the grill and uh it got pretty high recommendations from people so maybe have to try that maybe have to try that there you go absolutely i saw speaking of hot dogs i saw one where they took it was what do they call it the the bun was actually hamburger meat and then you put the hot dog in the middle uh, i've seen that as well (laughs) uh, yeah yeah that that looked interesting for sure for sure (laughs) Tosh, I had a shout out. The the I, I know some of the listeners and probably well, obviously a lot of non-listeners, but our YouTube, you know, we we're uh, people we've told the story. I mean, we're, we've started this thing. We're almost a year in, Tosh. This actually might even be the year anniversary or close to it for us. And along with the podcast build, right? We our social team has, has grown too. We started with nothing. Man, Friday night, a, a week ago. I was absolutely fired up. I sat at home. I had my laptop open because one of our YouTube shorts is a Steve Palermo, who was our throwback a week or two ago. He was the the umpire that was unfortunately shot while the mm-hmm. in her broke. Um, Lindsay put together a tremendous uh, YouTube short. Got to get these terms straight. And the thing went ballistic for us. I had over 6,000 views. Overall, our our YouTube page had like 8,000 views. I mean, that's absolutely incredible for us. I know that's just a drop in the pan for a lot of people, but for us, that, that's pretty cool. So I just wanted to give a shout out. And for all of you, check out the NoosaCast YouTube page. Um, we're on all of the socials, Instagram, uh, TikTok. You, know, you can get all of our, our Noosa Minute. You can get the podcast, but then you could just get creative. Uh, just we're trying to be creative. There yeah, you go. Look for that. Give us a... Give us a subscribe, give us a like, because it's you, you hear it from everybody, but it really, really helps. Just to just hit the subscribe button. It doesn't do anything else other than help us. So, but in the meantime, view it and and uh, thank you, thank you for all the the six thousand plus views. That was awesome. Yeah, that is awesome. And hey, hey, maybe a whole bunch of people will come on to this week's episode. Well, we do nothing more. Is is there's nothing more summer and Fourth of July. Then this week's interview with the web footers from yeah. Fremont, Wisconsin. So awesome interview the, they had a great time. We had a great time. Um, just listening to everything they do. It's not just jumping on some skis and going and showing you some stuff. There's practice, there's lifting, there's regiments and everything else that they do. And it's, it's a, uh, it's pretty intense. It's really cool to, to hear about. It is a year round athletes, Tosh. Tosh, this is a full, great 4th of July episode, right? You get some firework talk. You get a nice recipe. You get some food (laughs) talk, right? And now now we get into right water skiing. I mean, that's as 4th of July as you can possibly get. So absolutely. Yeah. We'll we'll take an old look at new and then we'll get right into the, uh, to the web footer interview. And it's, it's going to make for a 4th of July episode. Yeah. And if you've never been to a, a ski show, you should go. I know we have the web footers on in Fremont. There is a, a ski show in Wrightstown. Um, yeah. I remember going to the Tommy Bartlett show in Wisconsin Dells, which is no longer around, but I remember going to that. That was always fun. Um, so we talk yeah, about it. We do. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's uh, get out and check these out. You know, we, we, uh, we have a good time with them and, you know, they have concessions. They have everything you can imagine to uh, go out with the family and have a good time. Yeah, they were good guys, Tosh. I had a lot of fun with with those guys, and you're right. That, that's a full production, right? I mean, they have mm-hmm. they, they choreograph all this stuff. I mean, you have the boat crew, you you have the skiers, you have concessions, the announcer, you know, just the, the people that actually set the place up and tear it down. Right. I mean, it's a it's a big operation, but 
Yeah, it's a part of summer. And the, like you said, Tash, they're in Fremont, but they're, they're, I can't remember the number he said, but there's a lot of them throughout Wisconsin. Pretty much anywhere Absolutely. you go in Wisconsin, you'll, you'll be able to find, you know, a water ski show, but you're not yep. going to find any better one than, than the web footers. I think they're, they're a number one. And as we find out, you know, they, they compete. It's not just a water show. They actually compete in state and national competitions. Yep. So yeah, it's pretty cool. And yeah, we'll, uh, you folks will enjoy that, but uh, first, Tosh, you and I are going to take an old look at new and keep this show rolling. Sounds good. It's that time again, once again, for an old look at new, brought to you by Raleigh Winter and Associates, celebrating 55 years. Did you know that in 1962, an Appleton junior high school teacher with a strong work ethic started a residential realty company. His name, Raleigh Winter. Three generations later, the Winters still hold true to a strong work ethic and an excellent reputation in the community. Today, Raleigh Winter & Associates remain actively involved in providing retail, office, and industrial users an affordable, well-designed working environment through the creation and or acquisition of quality real estate in the Fox Cities and even beyond new. So what do you say? Let's take an old look at new. All right, Newscast listeners, it is time for our July 4th edition of the old look at new and see what we uh, have in store for you this week, Joe. What's your old look at new for the week? Well, Tosh, being that it's the 4th of July, I just had to know when did Wisconsin first celebrate the 4th of July? Any guesses? Uh, absolutely yeah, not. I didn't either. I had no <laughs> clue. But it was 1846, Tosh. 1846 in the beautiful city of La Crosse, of all places, La Crosse. So this dude, this Captain Nicholas, Nicholas, he was a Black River pilot. He moored his raft of lumber, Tash, at the foot of Pearl Street on July 3rd in La Crosse. He hopped off that boat and he announced that he's going to celebrate and recreate the ensuing anniversary of the American independence, which was the 4th of July. So this got all fired up after, you know, being a riverboat captain. So the next day, him, his, his crew, and a bunch of people from town, they, they set up, a, you know, a little stage. They, they, they got ready for the festivities and... All was well. They're all congratulating each other. They're, um, you know, it was, it was appropriate for the time. Tosh, it was a morning festival, mm-hmm. only to be followed by a banquet. Tosh, at this banquet, they served edibles. Now, it doesn't say what kind of edibles, Tosh, but they served edibles. And, Tosh, they had potent drinkables. So this was a rowdy party. I'm thinking I kind of <laughs> wanted to be there. The cross is still known for that, aren't they? Pearl Street. Can, yeah. Let me tip back a few. Yeah. Yeah, the Pearl Street Brewery. Yeah. Yeah, you have the Oktoberfest. So, yeah, there's two big, huge. Yeah, Pearl State Brewery, if you're ever in La Crosse, go check it out. It's an excellent little brewery. Absolutely. And obviously, the Oktoberfest Festival for that entire week is awesome as well in La Crosse. Absolutely. Totally agree, Tash. Totally agree. Obviously, Captain Nicholas knew that as well. And yeah. After downing these edibles, Tash, and, and some drinks, uh, all was well. All, basically, all hell was breaking loose, and they were celebrating like like... No, they were celebrating the 4th of July, Tash, and they decided that somebody must make a speech. And they, they found some sorry sap to make some kind of a speech. It wasn't a very good speech. Tash, he needed more edibles and uh, potent drinkables to get through this speech. And it was so bad, in fact, that this makeshift stage broke and this poor sap went flying out into the crowd. And all hell broke loose, Tash, when that happened. And, and the uh, the celebration came to an end after that episode. But uh with a hangover tash the next day the, the crew got on the boat and they they sailed out on the i'm sure the mississippi with that load of lumber and uh left behind the very first celebration of the fourth of july in wisconsin so tash, all right yes yes well that is that is rather interesting <laughs> that <Joe>. was thank <laughs> you to the lacrosse tribune so, for that i happened to just stumble across that fine story it was first printed in 1927 so pretty cool tash okay how about you tash what are you taking right. a look at well, I'm going back to July 4th as well, but I'm going 10 years earlier than you to 1836. Nice. And in 1836, uh, the Wisconsin Territory was created. Yeah. And the Wisconsin Territory basically included what is now the states of Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, and parts of North and South Dakota. So just 
10 years earlier than your little uh, July 4th celebration yeah. on July 4th, 1836, Wisconsin territory was created. And that obviously led to the state of Wisconsin and all those other states as well. I love that history, Tash. I'm starting to read about some of that again. And, you know, that Lewis and Clark had just a little while before that first explored that, the fur traders. And that's kind of cool. I love history. And I, I love that, Tash. That's a good one. Well, a little July 4th edition for you all. Yes. And uh, hope you enjoyed an old look at new. Who is it sponsored by, Joe? Tash, it's sponsored by Raleigh Winter and and. Chris's office, you know, speaking of the 4th of July, Chris's office is out near Ballard and, and Capitol Drive. Prime, prime seating for the 4th of July fireworks. Uh, I've been there many years out in that back berm behind his, his office watching the fireworks go. So, yes, Rally Winter, not only a great place to watch fireworks, but a great sponsor of an old look at new. gentlemen we enjoyed performing for you one more time today we hope to see you again next year ladies and gentlemen we are your 2023 web footer water ski show team thank you very much Well, I think just, Carl, right before you came on, I was asking Chris just to kind of, I guess more than anything, maybe just introduce your, you know, yourself, just for our knowledge, kind of who you are, what you do with, with the web footers. I'll go ahead and then I'll hand it off to you. Um, yeah, so I'm a skier on the team. Uh, I am one of the more elder statesmen of the, uh, of the skiers. And um, my involvement got going in the first place when my son got um, joined the team about 12, uh, what, 12, 13 years ago. And um, <clears throat> in addition to the skiing side of things, I'm also the marketing director. So I do quite a bit as far as going out into the community, meeting with uh, different businesses that want to be involved with a, a nonprofit youth centered organization like us and uh, enroll those guys into different sponsorships for the club in terms of um, ways for them to publicize their community involvement and us to uh, try and pay for some of our expenses along the way as well. Um, sure. So that's, that's 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 myself in a nutshell, and I'll hand it off to Carl to give you a scoop on him. Sounds good. Well, my involvement got started pretty much the same way as Chris's. Uh, my daughter uh, decided she wanted to learn how to ski. Um, actually, it was uh, her music teacher uh, has been on the team forever, and uh, she had talked about the team going to China and stuff like that, so she wanted to go watch her ski. She went and skied and or went and watched a show. And uh, after that, it was uh, they had their learn to ski event. So she went to the learn to ski event. And after that, it was all she could talk about is that she was going to be a web footer. She was going to be a web footer. And next year she joined and we went to the, our first indoor practice. And I made the mistake of volunteering, saying, that, well, yeah, I could probably help out on stage if uh, if the need was there. <laughs> and I have been on stage ever since. Nice. Wow. So I guess I'll I, a ton of questions really so the, the the actually the web footers when when did they start how long have they been around i mean you, you guys are, are based out of out of fremont but but i i will get into it i know you travel and there, there's different competitions but the web footers in general when when did they start 1976 okay great year there used to just be um more or less a group of kind of goofballs out there on the wolf river that uh decided to kind of go from a lot of just recreational skiing to at one point, let's kind of go ahead and put together a little show and, uh, and just very much a local, you know, grassroots kind of thing. And from there over the course of um, now 40, 40 some years, uh, 48 years or so, um, the team has just grown and grown and grown to be, um, what we can, what we're classified as is a division one team that there's different levels of ski teams that compete at different uh, levels within the tournaments. And uh, division one is the highest level that you can be in. And so we've got very, very small, um, very, very small town that we're part of, like you said, with Fremont um, being a town of about 750 people. Um, we've got skiers from Oshkosh, from Appleton, 
um, local towns around Fremont and Fremont itself. But um, it, uh, it's really a neat organization because it's such a vast number of families that have like multiple members that are in it, like Carl and his daughter, my son and myself. And by the end of every summer, we're pretty much one big family as far as the group coming together and bonding um, throughout the entire summer the way we do. That is the striking thing about you guys. It, it is, uh, that was predominant, is families. I mean, that's literally the first guys that, that started it. I mean, that, that started the tree, right? The family tree. Right. I mean, when you have ski shows going on, it's summer, and you think summer, people think summer. I know I've been there a few times. Um, but I don't think what people realize is what you brought up before, is that it's not just the Wolf River. You guys are going all over the place and in tournaments and everything else. Could you touch on that a little bit more? Sure. So we have two major tournaments that uh, uh, we we hope we are involved with every year. Uh, the first being the state tournament. And uh, if we qualify well enough at the state tournament, then we qualify for the national tournament where we, te- we uh, actually compete against uh, up to 16 other teams from around the, the, the country. Okay. Um, Wisconsin is kind of unique because we have so many teams in the state of Wisconsin that our tournament is just a state tournament. All the rest of them are regions, and they they actually travel from different states to their regional tournament. Now that's how we qualify for those tournaments. Okay. As wet footers, we also put on a Fourth of July show in Menasha and Nina every year. And in the last few years, we've been doing the Bloom Glow in Manitowoc as well. Nice. That stupid question. I'm I'm known for that. I, do you guys the, the the ramp that you jump on? Do you so when you do these traveling shows, are you hauling that ramp with you to to Manitowoc, or does somebody in Manitowoc have a ramp for you guys? Yeah, that's that's one of the few pieces of the show that we can't really take take on the road. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting because the. The in and out of that ramp is a once a summer thing on both sides of the uh, summer because it's no picnic getting it, you know, in and out of the water and getting it exactly placed how you want it as far as the setup, the setup for having our jumpers get their best results and so forth. So, yeah, we can we can road show a ton of the rest of our gear to make it a really neat road show for those those travel shows. But that's one thing that with this that does doesn't work out is, is this is the jump. But. It's also a great time for us to entice um, folks who are seeing us in places like Manitowoc and Nina and Menasha to say, come out to Fremont um, for a free show any Sunday or Wednesday, and then the show is only amplified from what you're seeing here today. Sure. So the skiers that are, that are competing in, in the competitions, are they also the same skiers that you'll see on Sunday and Wednesday in Fremont as well? Yes, they are. I, what? I mean, that it's an athletic sport. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not much of a skier, but I can't imagine their, their core strength, leg strength that it takes to, to water ski at that level. What is a, a typical training schedule for, for a water skier um, preparing both for competition and, and your shows? Yeah. Good, good question. A couple of things that I would just say is that the, especially the older that uh, some of us uh, skiers get, the more dedicated you are in the off season. Um, you do learn a lot about different areas of your body that really, really are critical towards the skiing. And, and you touched on it with the core strength. Um, mm-hmm. Core is such a huge, huge part of what we do with everything that's the pyramid type of uh, skiing and the different skiing scenarios where you've got, you know, multiple people latched onto each other one way or another, that uh, the core piece is pretty critical. Um, from a team standpoint, we're actually in um, gyms throughout the winter where we do indoor practices where we're simulating a lot of the different ski acts without obviously being on the water, but we'll latch up our ski ropes onto a, you know, a stationary point. And then again, without being on water, we're, we're simulating the, the pyramid building and like some of the doubles and trios types of acts as far as best, best practice we can do. So that's, that's typically eight or nine practices throughout the, um, throughout the off season. Um, on, on weekends. And then as soon as we can hit the water in spring, we're trying to get ourselves uh, into skiing shape as fast as we can, because obviously in Wisconsin, we've got a, a very short window to sure. get ourselves ramped up that way. Those pyramids are incredible. Your website has a lot of great pictures of, I mean, 
geez, you got some or like five people high. It, 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 how does one do that for the very first time? How, how on earth does that even work? I, I, it just, it's, it's like the most amazing thing in sports is a water ski pyramid in my mind. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, that's, that's high praise. Um, I'll say this, the, the people who have really, really dedicated themselves to the sport and have really dedicated themselves to mentoring, um, they have got so much of this into literally science in terms of the technique of the climbing technique and the, the methodologies to the pyramids. It still doesn't all work out plenty of plenty of times. Um, but at the same time, um, like I say, it's such a neat, neat sport because you just have so many people who realize it's niche, realize that it's not broad, um, it's, it's not widespread, but yet they, they want to grow the sport. And so they take anybody, everybody who wants to learn. And Carl's daughter is a great example. I remember when she was an imp of a little, little thing. And um, <laughs> real frankly, we love having those little ones that are having the gusto to climb because the higher that they get, the more weight that's up on the shoulders of the, of the pyramids. And, uh, you know, to watch like her confidence grow as she grew that confidence to climb all the way up to that top of the pyramid. And she was there for a long time. And now that she's grown into a, a young lady, now she's, you know, a couple layers down. But, um, yeah, that, like I say, there's a lot of there's a lot of science to it, although sometimes there's a lot of chaos that ends up happening in the water as well. Sure. <laughs> how important, I'm assuming it's very important, but how important is the boat driver and just that, that skill? Very important. Um, you know, the drivers I, I go through uh, some pretty extensive training to get their licenses for USA water ski. You can definitely tell um, what watching as your experience gets there, you, you can see when a, ba a driver's having a bad day. You know, we've got some really good drivers. We've got some very good experienced drivers um, with our team that so it's and, and, and there again, uh, we pass that down as we get new people into the team that want to drive. We get them trained. We it, it, it's, you know, you really got to think about the legacy of what's going on. So, you know, it's it's. It's a learned skill for sure. So speaking of the boat, I mean, Mercury Marine look, look like a Very big much. sponsor of, of, of yours. How, how does the boat, are you guys buying a new boat every year? Is this boat last 10 years? Like how, how does the, the actual ownership of the boat, the engines, is, is that, how does the logistics of the boat work for you guys? Yeah, well, I'm glad you go ahead. I'm glad you went ahead and gave us the, uh, the immediate plug on Mercury Marine. Um, Mercury is a invaluable, invaluable partner, and they are involved with so many ski teams because of what they see, what the ski teams bring to the communities and bring to the youth of uh, the teams. And so what we're lucky enough to do is we change out motors every single year. Now, the boats themselves, they stay the same until they hit a point where they're, they're no longer safe. But the boats are typically can easily be 15, 15 year boats in many cases. And uh, with that great relationship we have with Mercury, like I say, we're at a point where we can um, buy, buy engines from them um, at a pretty special um, offer as part of their sponsorship. And then we can turn around and we can, we can sell those after the year is done. And by doing that, we stay under warranty at all times with Mercury's motors. And so, you know, that is such a huge piece. If we didn't have that piece of the of the um, partnerships that are that are, we have, I really don't think we could exist. Um, it is sure. just a huge, huge piece of making us viable because it's such an expensive sport well beyond the motors and everything. But that's the kingpin of of the of the costs for sure. Oh, I believe it. So somebody who might enjoy the speed and stuff, what what kind of uh, what are your motors on the backs of your boats? All of our motors are the uh, uh, the Mercury Four Stroke Two Fifties. Okay. Um, and we have one boat that has one of them on there. We have one boat that has two of them on there, and one boat that has three of them on there. Wow. So, <laughs> and it's not about speed for us; it's more about power. Power, yeah, absolutely. But the speed's there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just chime in from a skiing standpoint that. When you get behind that, the, the, the three-motored one we call the triple rig of our, of our engine, of our, of our boat grouping. And um, when you ski behind that, that triple rig, and there's a ski act that we start at the beginning of our show 
where we have about 28 people or so in the water, all getting pulled out of the water to start skiing on two skis initially. And then from there, many, many of the people that are in that are going to slip out of their skis and start climbing to build the pyramid. But you know, many people have skied at some time in their life and they felt somewhat of a drag as far as getting out of the water. With that boat, 28 of us pretty much instantly pop out of the water. Wow. So <laughs> as far as your question about speed and power, I mean, it is just a uh, testosterone-driven machine, to say the least. So think about <laughs> popping that many people out of the water at one time. Yeah. What goes in? I mean, that's an impressive opener. What what goes into the to putting together a show? The the choreograph, the just the actual show. How, how do you guys plan for that? Does it? I'm assuming it might change every year. How, how do you come up with new pyramids and things like that? Uh, so every year we we uh, um, elect a new show director, and immediately after they are elected, they kind of put their group to, of people together that they want to. Um, have working with them and they'll start writing a script and they'll start putting a show together. They put it in acts in order of how they, how they think best the show will flow. And then we start filling in the acts between, you know, where we need some fill and where, um, and all those kinds of things. It is, um, we, like I said, we start that probably in September and right up until our, our state show in July, we are making changes, uh, trying to put the best show out on there on the water. So if you came to a show in June um, and you came back in the end of June, you might see two completely different shows. And you come back in August after we've gone through our two um, uh, tournaments, you might see a completely different show after that as well, just because we just it evolves all year long. What, what um there's a lot of components that go into a show it's just not you guys water skiing i mean we, we talked about the boat driver but i mean you've got i'm sure support you, you've got staff helping fans in i mean that's yeah, an announcer i mean it's it's a big production for you guys isn't it very much so yeah it, it really takes a village as far as it goes to uh to, to pull this <laughs> off and that's the neat thing too is that in many cases you might have kids that are on the team that are skiing and parents who have never skied have no intent to ski, but you know if we can put them to work possibly in the <laughs> concession booth, and uh, or we can put them to, to work on our prop building and building the props and setting up the props for the for the stage show and so forth. Um, there's just so many different things that are huge, huge pieces above, above and beyond the skiers that really pull it together and make it such a better experience for for our our attendees. And, and I guess speaking of that, just to, who is ever listening, uh, Wednesday and Sundays. But what, what is the the year schedule? What what months? Kind of the times. Um, when, when do you actually perform? The first show of the year is typically the first Sunday of June, and so we are underway already, and we're rolling. And those shows are always at six o'clock on Sundays and Wednesdays, and they go basically up until the uh, final Sunday before the Labor Day weekend. And that's when we usually are saying goodbye to a lot of our college kids. And so because of that, it's a time to wrap up the, wrap up the season. Um, but those shows that on Sundays and Wednesdays, they are free. And uh, that's a piece that we really think is a neat, again, hidden secret that uh, people sometimes don't know about just because we're a little ways outside of Appleton with that, right. with that little jaunt to, to Fremont. But it's a 20 minute little shot. And um, yeah, except for, the rare like Sundays that we happen to be at the state tournament or nationals for the most part, otherwise it's every Sunday, every Wednesday that uh, we've got those free shows that are, are rolling at six, six o'clock each time. Most of the people, if, if you're not, you know, maybe if your mom or dad weren't, weren't a skier, if you weren't born into a skiing family, how, how are kids and, and even adults attracted to skiing? I mean, do they have cottages? Are they winter skiers? How, how, what brings them to the water? Yeah. It it's a lot. It's a combination of all of that. I mean, we get kids coming to uh, the shows and they they want to join. We we actually have a uh, one of our guys that just joined this last week came to the show last Sunday and said, "You know what? This looks like a really fun thing to do. I want to try this." He had never skied before. <laughs> he is a phenomenal skier and he's been out there helping us ever since. Um, my daughter, same thing, went to a show. Um, 
some people they hear hear it from friends. Um, I know there there was a, a few years that we were actually we had some um, some of our ski team members that were going to schools and actively recruiting, trying to get people coming in, just letting them know what you know what we're about. The more the merrier. Um, anytime we can get more people, anytime we get new people, we we welcome them and. Uh, let's get them in. Let's get them in the show. It's been an interesting thing that we found with, with this podcast. And we, we talked to, you know, I guess niche sports, you know, the lacrosse, the volleyballs that, I mean, you know, there's, there's sports, but you guys are the, are the same thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's an opportunity, it's a, a sport and, and all the great things that come from sport competition, teamwork, all, all of that. And, and it sounds like you guys offer that. And that, that's, that's really cool. And all this, and I'll, I'll, pile onto that for a second saying that you know some of our kids that are in our program they are two or three other sports besides this as far as other interests that they have and this is a great cross training thing for them along with just learning just really neat leadership traits accountability traits responsibility but for other kids in our program sometimes they've tinkered in the classic ones they've tinkered in baseball and football and basketball maybe it wasn't really their thing and all of a sudden they find this as just something that is absolutely their passion. And so, you know, it's just another outlet to put them into something that's a really healthy um, activity, both from a physical and mental standpoint, as far as what it develops them through. And so I really love the idea of watching how the kids develop. And it's like I say, for some of them, it's, it's one more sport for others of them. It is their deal. It's, it's sure. their one, 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 one love. Hey, Newsicast listeners, help us grow by subscribing wherever you get your pods or sharing the Newsicast. Follow us on Facebook, X, TikTok, or Instagram. Northeastern Wisconsin Sports Advancement is a 501c3 organization. Our mission is to raise money, provide support, and bring greater awareness for youth sports organizations in Northeast Wisconsin. We do this primarily through the Red Smith Sports Award Banquet and the NoosaCast. Each year, we give back to the community through three initiatives, the Every Kid Plays Grant, the Gives Back Initiative, and scholarships to student athletes. So what is the, what is the ages, you know, your youngest to your oldest on your team this year? Ah, let's see here. Carl, you might know that one better than I do. Um, I'm, I'm going to take a pop at this and say that, um, you know, one, one of our youngest kids, Brooks, he is um, he's about five. And wow. on the top end of things, Lon doesn't know when to quit. Uh, Lon is still doing darn near any act that's part of the show. And Lon, I think, is hitting 62 this year. Nice. As a, yes. as a skier. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, so we've got all ranges that way. And, and we've actually uh, started adding in our junior show, our, our future show, uh, we have a three-year-old going out on a U-ski wow. during the oh show. Oh, my gosh. Jeez. Now, did three I hear, I know old. Chuck's not on the call, but did I hear Chuck was a, 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 at one time a barefoot national champion at a, at a pretty good age? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a, I forget what that division's called. Um uh, what's it called? Classics or legends or something like that. That he, uh, um, that Chuck is an outstanding skier to this day. And yeah, back in his day, uh, in you know a few years back, he was even better. But yeah, even for right now, he amazes me. Um, he's one of these guys that proves the junkiness level of this whole uh, sport as well. He <laughs> and my son and two or three other guys. Um, they go out Thursday mornings where they really want calm water for barefooting, and they will be on the Wolf River at five in the morning wow. to get the best water. <laughs> <laughs> so when you get you, when, you, when those guys really get become junkies, they will do anything to get that glassy water. What what is the the I guess the difference or the rush or the feel between you know traditional skis on and barefooting and I mean do you, do you have a preference what? Uh... What do you get off on better, I guess? Um, barefooting is far, far more difficult. Um, you, you don't have those skis to create a plane for you up on the surface. 
Um, and because of that, the speed is li- literally needing to be about 40, 42 miles an hour to be an effective barefooting uh, situation versus on, on water skis. You know, you can, you can water ski as low as 12, 13 miles an hour with the right skis underneath you, depending on yeah. kind of what you're doing. But um, the barefooting is definitely for those who are, who are daredevils um, and those who don't mind kind of bouncing off the water when it's fall time, because when you fall at 42 miles an hour, um, <laughs> it's, it's damaging. <laughs> yeah. Like how, how beat up yeah. do you guys, do, I mean, a fall like that, are you breaking bones? Are you black and blue? I mean, how does that, that can't feel good. You know, t- rarely does it, I mean, it, it, it hurts more at the moment. Typically it doesn't usually lead to like, um, literal injuries is more so just at that moment of feeling like, holy cow, that water felt pretty hard. But <laughs> amazingly, <laughs> amazingly it, it seems like it's it's not too damaging on just straight falls. The the bigger thing that we really, really work hard to be safe about is when we have falls happen where you have a lot of skiers that are falling at once um, in, in like a pyramid situation. Um, those things typically fall backwards and that usually works out. Okay. If they happen to fall okay. forwards, that's when you got a lot of people that can be real, frankly, knocking into each other. And right. that, that can be, that can be kind of dicey, but you know, we do a lot of different precautions to really minimize those things, but it still is pretty, pretty edgy stuff that, that we do. Sure. That brings up a question when, you know, you were just talking about, I have friends who are big skiers, glass, the glass water and stuff. How does your show change depending on conditions and how much does that really make you guys work and think and do different things as well? Yeah. Looks like last night, I think, huh, Carl? <laughs> yeah, very much so. <laughs> um, you know, our, our show is inherently bad water, especially okay. where we ski. Uh, because we put so much turbulence out there on the water ourselves. I think it actually helps us when we go to tournaments and there's uh, um, not a seawall for the uh, the water to bounce back off of and get back out into the... Sure. It actually does help us because it, it, it gets dissipated a little bit. But yeah, our, our water is inherently bad. The more boats you put out there, the, the worse the water gets. Um, you know, weather itself definitely takes a toll. Um there, there's nothing like standing there waiting for an act to come in and you're like, um, I know there's supposed to be somebody coming in and my script <laughs> is completely done and I do not know what to say anymore. <laughs> I, I, just a quick question. You, you were talking about the fall, but falling forward. Can you can you teach the skiers like to fall backwards? Is that something that, that you're conscious of in those moments? Is that a... <laughs> I, I guess the tough part of it is that, you know, when a fall happens, it's not really a planned action. So somewhat it's going to kind of take you where it's going to take you. But a lot of just like the the length of the ropes and so forth in the pyramids, um, a lot of times the lengths have just got a little bit of variance, which takes that pyramid into having just a little bit of a backwards slant. That if you have, if you watch pyramids when they come through in a show, if you're watching it from directly from the side angle, you can see where, like I say, it's got just a little bit of a backward tilt to it. So that tends to take falls backwards. Um, sure. But yeah, if you're in a moment, um, the longer you ski, if you feel, if you're more of like in an, in, an, in an individual act and you feel a fall coming, sometimes you can kind of cushion the situation. But when it's a group fall, um, a lot of times things just go go badly. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Your indoor practices, what, what do those look like? I mean, is it, is it a lot like maybe like a cheerleading where, where you're working on, on building pyramids <clears throat> in a gym? Yeah. Our, we actually really do um, focus mostly on pyramids during our indoor practices. Um, you know, the climbing of those pyramids, um, walking on people's shoulders to get to your right spot so you can start to climb. You know, if you start spread out and you have to come together, um, you have to, you know, you have to know that you have to work together with somebody to cross over on somebody to get over to the next person as people are climbing up and you move towards the center. And then, of course, when you come back down, you also have to move back to the outside. So, I mean, there is an art to it. um, And we do really focus on those climbing uh, during the 
during the winter months in the gym. That still blows me away. I just don't know how you do that for the first time. <laughs> I can tell you the first time I saw my daughter at the hot, at the top on a four high pyramid in a gym and she's touching the ceiling. I'm like, Oh my. Yeah. <laughs> so she has no fear. She just loves that. She just loves it. Yeah. yeah. She would climb to the fourth tier now if she, if, you know, if she could. Right. And I think she still could physically. It's just that, um, you know, the, the higher the weight is for everybody as you as you get older, it's harder on the people on the bottom. Right, right. Yeah. Poor people at the base. The standing joke for the base guys is to say, don't feed the climbers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you guys mentioned the state tournament. Where's state state this year and when does that happen? Yeah, so state tournament is always in Wisconsin Rapids. Um, okay. There's a lake over there called Lake Wazicha. And that um, it's a phenomenal ski site um, that it's um, it's it looks more like a river than a lake in terms of being a relatively somewhat narrow but long strip. And um, there's a very much a neat you know, like ramping down terrain of uh, of of land that almost sets the area up almost like a stadium viewing as far as how you can both sit on you know your own chair if you want to and dig into some red sand that's part of like beach shoreline. Otherwise, there's bleachers there as well. And that's the uh, third weekend of July every year is the standing, basically, expectation for state tournament. And uh, it's a four-day deal. That uh, It's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday with individual, um, individual competitions starting out across Thursday and part of Friday. And then team competitions that are going Friday through Sunday where um, there's about 27 teams that typically compete, 28 teams that compete um, in that. And like Carl mentioned before, as far as Wisconsin being such a a mecca of water skiing, um, our state tournament is actually the largest water ski tournament in the country. Oh, wow. Wow. Is is water skiing, is is that more of a northern thing? I mean, I'm assuming they water ski in all 50 states, but is it is it a Midwest, upper Midwest thing predominantly? Yeah, it it really does seem to concentrate more in the upper Midwest. Um, Florida obviously has some some really good teams and um but they're they're again it's hard for them to ski in the summer sure it's it's hot down there and um so they they do more of their skiing in the in the winter time um but out east they have they have there's teams smattered all over the country sure Uh, but wisconsin does have the the largest uh group of skiers and then the national circuit so you win state. Do you do you move on to national? Is there national competitions? Yeah, there's a, there's a national um, national show ski tournament every year, and it's typically about 16 teams, like Carl mentioned uh, initially. And what happens with that is that you'll have the winner of each region or the winner of state from the different state tournaments that automatically get the first pieces and parts of the the first eight or nine teams. And then there's about eight or eight or nine more teams that are at large bids that basically receive invites based on how they scored in their regional or state tournament. And with Wisconsin having the the strength of the number of excellent, excellent teams that are part of it, we typically have a, a, a good number of teams that end up getting those at large bids where it's very common for us to have as many as um, five or six teams that are part of that 16. So, so yeah, it's, um, you know, if, if you win our state tournament, you're guaranteed. But at the same time, um, if you're just having a, a very, very strong showing at our state tournament, you have a very good likelihood of having a, an invite to the nationals as well. Just kind of going back to to a show on a Wednesday or Sunday, somebody who's never been to one and you're trying to pl- you know, pitch, pitch the idea that they, why they should come. What would you tell somebody who wants to come to a show and it's their first time? What, what, the, what would they expect? Typically, our shows that we start off, you know, um, bring your appetite. We got a great concession stand, first of all, um, and we have some great sponsors that help uh, put food in that concession stand. So, uh, we definitely want you know bring your appetite, but come to the show. We have a we have a grandstand, brand new grandstand that uh, we built a few years ago. Um, that's right at center stage, or you could bring your lawn chairs. Um, there's a place over at the bank where there's a lot of grass to sit on over there, but in both places, you'll be able to see the show 
great, both the stage show as well as the water ski show itself. Um, and, and come to have fun. Just, you know, um, we're out there having fun, trying to entertain. And um, it, it, it's, it should be relaxed. You should be relaxed. Uh, um, you're going to see, see some good skiing, some some bad acting on my part, some, uh, <laughs> and here's some good music. And, uh, um, yeah, it's, it, it's a good time. That's, that's the whole thing. We're trying to have, let everybody have a good time. That's what it's all about. So, yeah. We typically start our junior show or our future show at about 6 PM. And that usually runs about 15 to 20 minutes. And then our main show starts within about 15 to 20 minutes of that ending. So. And without, without tooting our horn too much about this, um, I think it's really neat to get feedback from a lot of our family members are attending the shows week in and week out, and they're watching the shows that to cheer us on, but they'll be sitting next to somebody who's never been to one of the shows. And the, the things that they'll tell us about what those people are commenting and, you know, ooing and eyeing as they're watching, we lose track of what we're doing out there as far as, you know, compared to a single water skier behind a boat, this is such a horse of a different color in terms of what they see with these pyramids and the speed and the, the agility of, of some of the, especially the younger kids and the, the jump acts and whatnot. Um, like I say, it's, it's skiing that unless you've been to many, many ski shows before, um, you have no idea what you, what you're about to see as far as comparing it up against like I say, a standard tuber or a water skier and not to diminish that, but just to say that, this is just at a whole different ball game. It's the big leagues. <laughs> <laughs> and it's even different than, um, um, you know, the old Tommy Bartlett or some yeah. of those shows, um, because we're able to act, cause we have more skiers typically than what they do. So we're able to even put bigger things out on the water than what they were during some of those shows. Yeah, it's interesting you said it, it. I forgot about that name. That that was my childhood experience was Tommy Bartlett for sure. Remember that? <laughs> you had mentioned earlier uh, you had learned to ski w with the youth. Is that is that year round? Is that a couple of times a year? How, how do the the youth, if they really want to get involved, what what uh, other than going to your website, what what do you offer them, or uh, how many opportunities? I guess we actually just had our learn to ski event for this year. Um, we, we used to do it in the in August, but it always happens to be a really busy weekend for us. So we decided to move it up to June this year. Um, but so we, we yeah, it's, it's a one, it's a one day event. We teach about 55 to 60 kids wow. how to ski, actually kids and adults. This year we had some adults that went out there and wanted to learn how to ski as well. Yeah, that's awesome. And um, we give them, you know, we give them about 45 minutes in the boat. There's about three or four per boat that go out there and uh, we get them up on water, either on a boom or a long line. If they've, if they've proven that they could do it and just give them the opportunity to be what it feels like to be up on water skis. The other piece too, is that even beyond the learn to ski day, which is incredible as far as the number of kids that get to taste that for the first time. But the other thing is, is that the, the club membership, this is not a tryout organization. Anybody who wants to be a web footer right. and is willing to, you know, commit themselves to the effort, they're a web footer. And so even on our, our two, besides the two shows a week, we practice two nights a week. And on our practice nights, although there's a lot of the big acts that are being worked on, those acts always have lag time in between there. And during that time, we've got all kinds of spots where the, you know, many of the newer kids who are learning to ski, they are still just working on getting up on skis. And so there's, you know, developmental aspects of, every part of our, our, our program that are well beyond just the learn to ski days. And so uh, like I guess I the plenty of kids join the team who have never skied and sure. um, they, they learn from the ground up that way. <laughs> That's fantastic. And actually to add on to that as well, we had to thanks to guys like Chuck, you know, they come out and actually come out on Thursdays and we'll take a, a group of skiers out and give them extra skills and give them extra time out on the water. Um, he'll hold a barefoot clinic. He'll do, um, uh, Chuck has actually written, a, uh, an article for USA water ski on how to do hop docks where you, where you hop off the dock and that's your ski start. So it, it, Chuck's have been a great, um, you know, asset to our team and to teams around the country, uh, teaching people how to ski. 
No, that's great. That's that's right. That's how you grow the sport. That's how you can continue the sport for sure. Well, guys, this has been fantastic. I, I am definitely going to come out to, to Fremont to, to see a show. Um, is there anything else that, that we need to know as we as we trek out west from the Fox cities? You know, and I, I guess I would just say this. Uh, the, the teams all over the states, um, all the teams work so hard that, you know, even if somebody happens to hear this and getting to Fremont isn't, re- isn't reality, do some searching on the Internet See if you've got a team near you, because as much as we work hard to promote our team and get our name out there, sometimes people have never heard of us. And same goes for so many other ski teams that are out there. And they all put on great shows. They all put on fun, family, you know, entertainment. And like I say, we'd love you to come to ours. But just again, in trying to grow our sport, you know, if you are up by Manaqua, there's a team up there. If you're, you know, all over the state. 25, 35 teams that are actively putting on shows weekly, get to one of them because they're all fun. Absolutely. Yeah, speaking of connecting, I, I see you guys have a, a nice social presence as well, right? That That's something that's changed in, in the life of a web footer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We work really hard on trying to, trying to drive the, the social side of things. Our, our Facebook page is actually closing in on 7,000 followers. So we are uh, awesome. always, always trying to continue to build the brand. That's for sure. Like and subscribe, right? Just keep hitting that like button, follow That's button. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a, it's a different way we communicate, but um, no, that, like I said, this this is fantastic. It's it's stories that we love on the new sick cast, and you guys even mentioned it. I mean, it's a hidden gem. You, you guys have been around for forty years yet, so you just forget about it. I think sometimes. So we're let's make a trek to Fremont and watch you guys build pyramids. Yeah, absolutely, I yeah, absolutely. I, and you know, you know, there's there's certain shows that we are nailing them left and right as far as the acts are succeeding, and uh, that is fun for the crowd and fun for the the skiers. There's other times where we jokingly call it a spills and thrills show, and uh, as much as we wanted to put on a better amount of success, sometimes the falls aren't all that bad as far as you know, providing some entertainment as well. So either way, I think people <laughs> yeah. have a good time when they when they come on even on a, a good one or a bad one. Guaranteed a good show. I love that. <laughs> All right, Newscast listeners, welcome to our throwback. Um, what you're about to hear is a glimpse of the entire interview of Ed Nettycomb who was the legendary track coach for Wisconsin. Uh, He was at the Red Smith Award banquet as a Red Smith Award winner back in 2014 and was interviewed by Dave Edwards. I mean, remember, this is just a glimpse of it. If you want to catch the entire interview, please head to our YouTube channel where you can see the entire interview on Sunday morning. Red Smith Sports Awards Banquet Throwback. The Red Smith Award, of course, goes to someone who has made some unique contributions to sport in Wisconsin and also epitomizes the great values that Red Smith exhibited. Let's give a Red Smith welcome. Let's get to know our 2014 Red Smith Award winner. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ed Nuttycomb. Wow, that's a lot of people. (laughs) Well, he told me to relax, so I'm gonna sit like Uh, this. Why not? (laughs) Congratulations. Thank you. Paul Horning's won this award. Ray Nitschke's won this award. Barry Alvarez has I won this award. S- I saw that. 
Ron Dane. Ron Dane's won this award. Yeah. How does that make you feel? Oh, those names are... Um, I mean, Jackie Joyner Kersey. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I know I watched her compete for many, many years. What an honor to be uh, amongst that uh, group, too. Um, I'm not sure how I even got uh, to that status, but I'm very appreciative. And uh, wow, what, a, what an incredible event. I was certainly aware of the event itself, but had no idea that it was of this magnitude and size. Congratulations to all of you in the community and and the group that put this together, what a, a great event and a great cause for the young people in sports in general. When you look back on all those championships, do you, do you ever just go, good grief, look what we did here? Well, I think I did kind of start putting some of that together in the end. But, you know, it's, you, you, just, you take one year at a time, one mm -hmm. meet at a time. And um, I think I said it, it's, it's, it's just staggering to realize all those years went by and, and you start adding them up and... It's just what we ended up with. <laughs> was, was it easier or tougher as you went along, kept winning championships, 26 cross-country championships, if I'm not... Was it tougher because they were gunning for you, or was it easier because now I can get all those good recruits, they're going to love me? Um, I, it didn't get any easier, but I tell you <laughs> what, I, I liked being the one that they were shooting for. It, was, uh, it made it a challenge, and it was fun, and uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't have wanted to be the chaser. I liked to be in the chasee. Mm -hmm. When you moved here, we've seen a little bit of the story that you moved here from Virginia, came here thinking, oh, this would be pit stop for a year or two, maybe, and then we'll head home somewhere along the way. What happened? Uh, the University of Wisconsin, Madison, track and field, uh, the state of Wisconsin. Um, uh, my wife's from New York. I'm from Virginia. We moved here, and uh, we said three to five years. I think what attracted us the most is all these lovely winners that we... Uh, <laughs> What's going on out there? I mean, my goodness. Is it ever going to end? <laughs> when you see all those championships being won, the individual championships, uh, what stands out? 297 academic all Big Ten. 297 of them. What stands out in that? I think one of the things that made the University of Wisconsin really attractive to me was the fact that I was able and blessed to deal with great athletes in many cases, but also the University of Wisconsin is a very tough academic institution, and you're dealing with very smart young people who are motivated not only on the track but in the classroom. And uh, it, it, you know, that's what they're there for. And uh, I, you know, our classroom mm -hmm. is the track. And uh, many of them excelled there, but a lot of them excelled in the classroom, too. And I'm v equally as proud of that. When it came time to say, okay, I've had enough, was that a tough decision? Very, very tough. It was a tough decision. But, mm -hmm. you know, the coaches in this profession and, and, and many professions spend lots and lots and lots of time, way beyond going to the track in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And it got to the point where I just, I, I, I felt that I didn't have anything to prove to myself or anyone else. And I, I really wanted to have more time for my family. I have four grandchildren now. And uh, my son lives in Milwaukee. My daughter lives in Madison. I wanted more time for my wife and family. And, and uh, the only way you can do it, I, I, I couldn't halfway do it. You can't halfway coach. And, uh, and I, I just, I went as hard as I could to the end and stepped away and, uh, I, I, I miss it, but um, I'm looking forward to having the extra time, maybe doing a little fishing this summer. There you go. Ladies and gentlemen, our 2014 Red Smith Award winner, Ed Nutticombe. Congratulations, Ed. And we have right here. There you go. Tash, another great throwback. And remember, folks, you can get the full video version on our YouTube page. I'm going to beg and plead once again, please hit like and subscribe. Just hit subscribe and enjoy the throwbacks. There's a lot of great ones, well over 40 of them now in the library. So check those out. And Tash, well, we're getting pretty close to the end of another great episode, 4th of July episode. 
but we can't get out of here without forgetting something and well, never forgetting something and always forgetting something or something like that, Tash. For some reason, I can't get this straight these last couple of weeks. But what are you forgetting, <laughs> Tash, this week? Well, you know, I I, I knew about this in the past. And, uh, you know, I, I have never really totally been a part of it. Well, even though I have been, um, it's summer club parents. Oh, yeah. They're and a special breed, Tash, a special breed. They're a special breed. The yelling, the screaming the yelling at rest, telling your kid to shoot. Um, there's a reason I, I like to be that dad who sits on the far side of the field away from everybody so I can let the coaches coach, the refs refs, the kids play. I can just sit back and enjoy it. But uh, there's enough people who don't like to do that and they complain about it. And, you know, it, it, it's it's all around you. It's all the teams. You hear it all over the place. Um, you know, yelling at kids, yelling at the refs, Yelling at the coaches. It's, it's every uh, game. Every it, game, there's at least one is. person. Yeah, there is. It's it's kind of crazy. I mean, I'm like, you know, I you're not out there playing. Let your kids play. Let them enjoy themselves. This is a learning experience. Um, you know, I unfortunately, I think there's a lot of aspirations of D1 scholarships and things like that. And we know that, you know, of all the kids who go on to even play high school sports, uh, seven percent play any type of college and then of that seven percent there's what less than one percent that make d1 right and even the scholarships you look at that i mean it's it's not much you know you should really yell at your kid about doing their homework and getting good grades because that's going to get them more money for college than playing a sport but or yeah Tash, it's uh, realize that the kid is actually working hard going to practice right. doing what he's supposed to do it's okay to make mistakes you learn when you make mistakes yes that test what, what Absolutely. you just described so lacrosse summer lacrosse is, is literally is the worst it's been the worst experience i ever had officiating because the parents are right on top of you and taylor yeah. get ready to blow the fox 40 because they are nuts nuts that's two <laughs> fox 40 blows for you and i hope they were loud and in your ear because that was actually a technique i used on some parents where i would just freaking blow that whistle as loud as i could right in their ear because they deserved it I'm going to tell you something. The kids, your kid does not want to hear you. Doesn't want to hear you. He, right. he, I, yeah. I, kids have told me that on the field. They, they have told me, I wish my dad would shut up. I, that's happened to yeah. They, yeah, I've, I've officiated lacrosse. I think I officiated it for eight years. I've had dozens of kids tell me that. I have had dozens of kids come up to me in summer ball and say, I'm sorry for my parents. And that's yeah. a true story. And it's it's absolutely I mean, ridiculous. I'm just like you. I will not sit by them. It is one of the main reasons yeah. I do not officiate anymore. It's one of the main reasons why there are not officials. Boy, Tashi got me fired up on right. this. I, but, and, you know, it's where we, we mentioned lacrosse, but I've been the softball, summer softball travel teams and watched kids play. I've been the baseball watching kids. And it, it's it's not like this is something new. This has been going on forever. And, um, you know, it's about time that we as parents let our kids play and have fun and just enjoy what they're doing. Absolutely, because it goes by so fast. I'm a parent now that had kids go mm -hmm. through all of this and they don't do it anymore. And I miss it. I'll tell you right now, I yeah. miss it. And by you acting like a ass on the sidelines, you're missing it. And you're certainly not giving your kids exactly. the experience. I want to I want to just say one more thing on this subject for the <laughs> one or two percent that are, are the a-holes. Uh, right. The, all the parents are just like you and me. We hate that person. We, we, we're saying yeah. inside our head, and I don't know why we, we – probably because we don't want to make a scene, why we don't step up and say something. But all of us are, are embarrassed for this guy. We just want him or her, because it's both. It is definitely both, is. to just shut up. Yeah. And more than anything, yeah. you don't know what you're talking about. You're wrong. Yeah. And especially right. if you're going to start arguing rules with an official, you are flat out wrong 99.9% .9 of the time. <laughs> now that we got Joe fired up and uh, bleeped out on this family <laughs> podcast, um, Joe, what are you What are you forgetting Gosh, darn besides your, uh, <laughs> your F-bombs? <laughs> I uh, I don't miss officiating, Tosh. I really don't. It's it's you know, I, and this isn't even going to be my forgotten. It, it's just I, I don't miss officiating because of, of that. That 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 has soured yeah. me so much. But 
what I am trying to forget, and it's something that gets me equally as fired up, it's technology. And in particular, it's my earbuds. Tash, they are not syncing with my, I, I kind of stepped out in the new world, got myself an iWatch. So, you know, works great with the earbuds. I'm having trouble getting my iPhone to sync with my earbuds, to sync with my I, my watch. I just, I, every time somebody tries to call me and I'm on my phone, I can't take the call with the earbuds. I have to call them back and then it works. I mean, I'm just, Tasha, I hate technology. <laughs> it's probably me. It's probably operator error, but for God's sakes, I can't figure out what okay. the heck's going on. I say, just talk to your kids. Yeah. They'll have it all set for you in like five minutes. I, I have asked them, <laughs> and for some reason, they can't fix it either. So I, I don't know. Oh, Maybe yeah. I am one that uh, I do keep my phones pretty long. So I do know that after yeah. a certain time, stuff kind of gets a little wonky. So perhaps that, it, yeah. that's it. But uh, I don't know, Tash. I don't need the latest and greatest iPhone. I, I can go a couple of generations yeah. without one. That's true. All right. Well, at, at some point, you'll figure it yeah. out, Joe. And when you do, <laughs> it'll be awesome. Tash, I tell you, I think we're <laughs> halfway through the segment. I got to go take a shower here. I'm all sweaty and fired oh, up. <laughs> You are fired up today. Yeah, goodness sakes. Man. All right, well, let's get on to something a little bit better and something that I'm never forgetting. This is good stuff, folks. Tosh, what are you not forgetting? Well, since it is July 4th that this is coming out on, um, I want to think of the simpler times and the simpler fireworks that we used to love as little kids, the sparklers. Yeah. The snakes. The snaps. Yeah. Remember the pop snap? Oh, yeah. Snake. Yep. Yeah. Those are those are the blasts, you know? That Those are awesome, not the, you know, the percussions that you feel your house oh. shake with and stuff like that. But yeah, those simple, simple, fun fireworks, the cannons that would just shoot out sparks. Yes. Yeah. And uh, right. You know, every once in a while, like, the neighbor maybe would get one where there's like three and one on a little thing that sits yeah. up and, but yeah, you're right. I mean, those, those sparklers and yeah, it's a six year old right. kid running around the house with a sparkler. Was there anything better than that? It, even though it's probably like the most dangerous firework there is because <laughs> it's like molten lava, but <laughs> did a lot of crazy you know, things. burning metal. Hey. It was the seventies, yeah. seventies and eighties, you know? Yeah, that's true. But th those are, you know, you go and spend five bucks and you'd have like hours of fun with fireworks. Yeah. Yeah. Now you, if you spend five bucks, I, I don't know what you're getting. You know? I still, this... every once in a while, I'll get the pleasure being a letter carrier after after the 4th of July, so July 5th, we're carrying mail. Yeah. We, they are the snaps, right? Where you whip them on the ground and they, they snap. Yeah. yeah. Once I, you'll, I'll maybe find like a half a dozen if I'm in the right neighborhood. And gosh darn, man, I'm whipping those babies on the sidewalk because I'm going up to their porch. Well, my kids always like to take a whole pile of them and put it underneath, underneath the tire of the car. <laughs> yeah. So you back up in the morning and it's just like, boom. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Oh. I love that. Yeah, they do make, and... If, for those of you who don't know, they do make adult pops as well, and they sound like a firecracker going oh, off, not just a snap. Really? So yeah, you can you can find those at a few of the stands as well. So yeah, I'll have to check those out. Yeah, they'll be popping up here. Yeah, absolutely. So simple fireworks, Joe. How about uh, how about yourself? What do you never want? Well, to Tosh, I don't have um, a fireworks one, but I always baseball always kind of reminds me of the Fourth of July, and it was actually happened to be watching. Uh, uh, the, the Fox game a couple of, maybe two weeks ago. And it was, it was actually a special okay. one. It was, it was the weekend that Willie Mays died. So they had a tribute to, to Willie Mays and they played, uh, it was the old Negro baseball game in Birmingham, Alabama. So yep. they had for, for an inning, they went to the old TV coverage of what it would look like in the 1950s. And it was really okay. cool. And not, I don't remember the 1950s, but you know, this week in baseball in the 70s growing up, it, the 50s weren't that far before. Yep. So you'd see footage of it and you understood that the cameras were nowhere near what they were like now. Um, so it was kind of cool to have an inning of 1950s. Well, it was actually, yeah, maybe maybe even 1940s that they were showing. And then in 1950, they added, they said camera number four, which is that classic center field camera uh, that came along in the 50s. But just the evolution, Tash, of, of, of technology and and just the way they broadcast baseball and all the sports, but baseball in particular, it was, uh, it was pretty cool. And, and it, you know, we, you and I love talking to announcers and the announcers, such a huge part of that whole process. And it's, it was just kind of cool to just kind of reminisce and look at some old time baseball reminded me of my grown up years, Tash. So for those of you who are keeping track out there in podcast land, Joe is forgetting technology <laughs> but also never forgetting technology. <laughs> so um, he's doing a little bit of double feature this week. So for those of you who are keeping track. <laughs> you didn't even put two and two together, Tosh, but you are correct. Uh, 
<laughs> you absolutely are correct, Tash. That's uh, an inside look at my head. So, yeah, that's uh, that's what you get. Right. That's what you get. Oh, Tash, I love to be a podcaster. That's what I'm never forgetting is the joy of podcasting. <laughs> well, Tash, another great episode. Um, happy Fourth of July, everybody! Don't forget to like and subscribe. And Tash, let's go light some sparklers. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you for listening to another great episode of the NoosaCast. We'd really appreciate it if you hit up our social pages, subscribe, like, follow, and don't be afraid to engage. Head over to our YouTube channel to get exclusive content like the full interviews and speeches from the past Red Smith banquets. huge thank you to Digstown for all the music in today's episode. Catch a gig or find them on Spotify. <laughs>